the annual Mumbai International Literature Fest and the first one to go entirely digital. Our co-sponsors are Tata Steel and Tata Projects. TESPO, in collaboration with the Goethe Institute, Max Müller Bhavan, Mumbai, presents a live, digitized, dramatic reading of Roland Schimmelpenig's The Golden Dragon. In this dramatic reading of The Golden Dragon, adapted specifically for the digital medium, a local Thai Chinese Vietnamese restaurant becomes a point of intersection between the lives of seemingly unrelated individuals. Six intertwined stories unfold as chaos ensues over a bowl of hot soup and an unwelcome additional ingredient. Post the performance and to make the evening a little more special, playwright Roland Schimmelfinnig himself will join us and be in conversation with journalist and culture consultant Pragya Tiwari. Until then, we hope you enjoy the reading. Directed by Sharodhya Chaudhary, presenting The Golden Dragon. The Golden Dragon. Early evening. Pale summer light falls through the windows onto the tables. Five Asians in the tiny kitchen of the Thai Chinese Vietnamese fast food restaurant. A young Chinese man beside himself with toothache. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts. Don't cry. Don't cry. It hurts. Keep the pain. Voice pain. Don't cry. Don't cry. Don't scream. Screaming will use up all your energy. It hurts so much. It hurts so much. We're standing around the boy in the tiny kitchen of the Chinese Thai Vietnamese restaurant. Don't scream. It's really screaming. Number 83, Pad Thai Guy. Fried rice noodles with egg, vegetables, chicken, and spicy peanut sauce. Medium hot. The boy's got to take. Sorry. Our food is given. This is sit down at a table by the window. Table 11. Hello. Don't scream like that. The first stewardess says, Hello. The second stewardess says, Hello. Hello. That tooth has got to come out. Can I get you some drinks? Oh, God. My tooth. Oh God, oh God. A mild evening in late summer. An old man with gray hair, very thin, haggard, sick maybe, stands on the balcony of his flat. His granddaughter has been visiting him. Grandfather, granddad. She lives upstairs in the same building with a boyfriend in the little flat under the roof. And now she was going to tell her grandfather something special, something very special. But she doesn't tell him because her grandfather seems lost in thought or worries. Below them, the red lanterns of the Chinese Thai Vietnamese restaurant, the Golden Dragon. Apparently, everyone working in the kitchen is Vietnamese. But whether that's true. The old man says, if I could have one wish, if I could have one wish. Next to the old man on the balcony, a young woman, not yet 19. She is strikingly young and strikingly beautiful. She says, what is it, granddad? What would you wish for? The old man looks at the young girl. My granddaughter, I look at my granddaughter. You, you're so young. You look wonderful. Do you think so? Do you really think so, granddad? When I get to your age, what am I going to look like then? <laughs> I'm not going to see that. 
I'm not going to be around to see that. <laughs> I laugh. <You're> laughing. <laughs> I'll be dead a long time before then. I'll, I'll be dead and buried a long time before then. But what was it? What were you going to say? What? What were you going to say? You just said, if I could have one wish. Ah, yes, yes, I, I, I said that. Uh, if I could have one wish. He pauses for a long time, stands there with the empty wine glass in his hand. Number 101, sukiyaki, fried beef with straw mushrooms. And number B6, the carrot curry, a Vietnamese specialty. I've got them to take away downstairs in the Golden Dragon. He looks into the dusk. Hmm? He says nothing. Then? And you? What would your wish be? Yes, what? You've not said what you would wish for. In the kitchen of the Thai Chinese Vietnamese restaurant, the Golden Dragon, it's cramped. It's very cramped. There's no room, but there are still five Asian cooks working here. One of them's got two things. The boy, the one who's looking for the sister, the new one. We call him the boy. Too sick. And it's really hard. Don't scream, don't scream. Scream, yeah. but use up all your energy. We call him the boy because he's new. Because he's not been here so long. He's still new and he's got no money and not no papers. So a dentist is out of the question. Oh. He's so loud. An amber juice and a glass of white wine. Drinks for the stewardesses. That, that tooth's got to come out. Oh. How? Get it out. Get it out. There's no other way. Get it out. Out. The man in the striped shirt. Late thirties maybe. Already had a bit too much to drink. He's alone in his flat. Sitting at the kitchen table. Looking at the table. The fridge. His girlfriend has left him. Or she's thinking about leaving him. And now he hopes she's going to come back. He says, I wish you'd never met him. If, if she hadn't met him, if she hadn't met him, a sudden gesture which makes me knock some bail onto my trousers. Two young people in the flat they share under the roof. <laughs> Lovers. They've only been living together a couple of months. A wonderful time. One they'll never forget. Downstairs, the golden dragon. The young woman has just come back from seeing her grandfather who lives in the same building. Her boyfriend, the young man, says, How could it happen? She goes, I don't know. How could it happen? I don't know. I don't know how it happened. I don't believe this. I cannot believe this. I have no idea. You said... Me. You, you said nothing could happen. Yes. That's right. Look, I have no idea how it could have happened. This, this is a complete disaster. Total disaster. Everything was going so well. It, it, it was all going so well before. And now... How are we going to... You, you're far too... And the money... Where are we? The, the flat's too small for three and in the autumn you were... You, you, you were planning to go to... A total disaster! In the kitchen of the Thai Chinese Vietnamese fast food restaurant, The Golden Dragon. Hot box, a gas stove, a deep fat fryer, a clock, a Vietnamese calendar. Liking the wrong things, liking things like sweet, something he had always done. He had done that at home. 
Šumi, šumi je tut. Oh. oh god, it's completely black. The stewardess is order, 25. And 6. 25 and 6, Chinese noodles for fry and the Thai soup. Completely oh. black. Oh, you got to go to a dentist. <laughs> what dentist? How can you go to a dentist? A 25 and 6 for the table by the window. Number 31, Thai Grove Fry One. Crispy chicken breast with straw mushrooms, pineapple and peach in sweet and sour sauce. Number 25, Bami Pat. Fried egg noodles with filet of chicken breast and fresh vegetables. Number 6, Slice of chicken, coconut milk, fried ginger, tomatoes, one mushrooms, lemon grass and lemon leaf. Hot. The ant diligently collected provisions all summer long, while his neighbor, the cricket, made music day and night. She fiddled away day after day while the ant worked and worked, carrying the heaviest provisions into his burrow, while the song of the cricket wafted across the fields. And then winter came, and the winter was cold, and the cricket could find nothing left to eat. She was starving. No music anymore. Finally, the cricket went to the ant. Where else would she go? And asked him for something to eat. Can't you give me something to eat, please? I haven't eaten for days. No answer. Please, I'm so hungry. No answer. And the ant avoids the cricket's eye. The cricket looks terrible. Please, please, I need something to eat. Please. Please, I need something to eat. Now the ant looks up. I'm giving you nothing. You didn't do a day's work all summer. Not a single day. I'm giving you nothing. As far as I'm concerned, you can starve. You get nothing. You get nothing from me. In the kitchen of a four-room apartment, a couple of floors above the restaurant, the Golden Dragon. The man in the striped shirt, who's put bay on his trousers, and the woman in a red dress. In the corner, the silver fridge they bought together. Most of the things here are joint purchases, acquisitions for a shared future. In the early days, there was so much they didn't have. We need a corkscrew. We need a peppermint. We need a new frying pan. Why? What's wrong with the old one? It's broken. What do you think of this lamp? She's come back. Now you turn up. Says the man in the striped shirt. Now. Now you're here. Well, it's too late now. It's too late. I don't want you now. I, I can't do this anymore. I've waited and waited and waited and now it's, it's too late. He drinks. If only you'd never met him. Look at the state of me. I've spilled bill on my trousers and the shirt. Fucking stripes. I came straight from work here. I was, of course, hoping to see you here. Everyone wears a suit and tie. Yeah, that's it. That's the way it is. This, this is my life. What do you think of my dress? The dress you... I thought I'd wear it again. I wanted to... Why could we... Why couldn't we just go? We just go downstairs to get something to eat. Just go. We just keep going like nothing ever happened. How are we going to? You want everything back? The earrings? The jewelry? The ring? Do you want the ring back? The way you look, you look 
and and the dress and the dress that you you're stunning stunning If you go, these will drop out. When you're all toothless, who would have thought that your teeth really do drop out? I so wish I could be the way I was once. Young. I wish I was young again. I so wish I could be the way I was once. Upstairs, in the little flat under the roof, the young couple who were having such a wonderful time until now in their first flat, she has bought children's toys. Why did you get all this? So, um... Why? So you can get used to it. So you, so you'll be pleased. But I'm not pleased. I'm not pleased. I got these things so it will be easier for you to start being pleased. How am I supposed to start if I'm not pleased? In the back of the kitchen of the Thai Chinese Vietnamese fast food restaurant, the Golden Dragon. Drink! Drink something, some vodka! Boy has tears in his eyes. Percy. Percy has was born in Qingdao on the Yellow Sea. It's a long, long, long way from here. Drink! Drink something, some vodka! The thin man pours vodka into the boy's open mouth. Mm. Number 7 and 4, Bangkok style duck red curry with fresh mushroom, lemon pass and coconut. Hot. The little Chinese boy screams and screams and he's not used to it. Uh, uh, no, thank you, number. Number 51, fat with mamongwa, beef in saute sauce with peppers, onions, carrots and cashew nuts. Oh, he's going to pass out on us like this. He's going to pass out on us any minute. That tooth has got to come out. That, that, that tooth has got to come out. Out. Under the sink. Under the small sink, everything's small, everything's cramped, everything's hot. There are five of us cooking in here. Everything's cramped. A few square feet of tiling, 20 or 30 maybe, the gas cooker, a deep fat fryer, the work surfaces, the fridges, next door, a little space for storage, a clock on the wall from the Vietnamese world pillow. I'd like to go to Vietnam someday. The coast is supposed to be wonderful. Number 13, saute, saute six chicken and peanut sauce. Under the sink. Yeah. Under the sink, the toolbox. The toolbox? The red spanner. It's needed all the time for the gas cooker. Round the spanner, please. Round the spanner. Don't be afraid, my friend. Don't be afraid. The fat man pours vodka over the spanner. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. No, no. I pour some more vodka in his mouth. That helps. It helps. <laughs> Swallow it, swallow it! Which one is it then? This one. Mm. That man knocks on the door with the spanner. Oh, that one there. The right hand side. It's not looking good. Oh, the left one. It's not looking good either. The fat man knocks on the door with the spanner. They both look bad. The ant asks the cricket whether she can do anything, whether she can do anything special. What can you do then, huh? Dance, huh? Well then, dance. Go on. Come on, get on with it, show me. Show me, then maybe you get something. You can dance for me. The cricket dances. Mm. Yeah, it, it's pretty, but what use is it to me? It's beautiful the way you dance, but I'm not really interested. Not interested at all. 
the ant makes the starving cricket some suggestions. Cleaning. You can clean. If you want something, you've got to earn it. What about cleaning? Do some cleaning then. Or that gives me an idea. The ant rents the cricket out to the other ants. The ants latch after the cricket. They think she's vulgar. They think she's sexy. They're turned on by her accent. As much as the cricket can speak the ants' language. To the ants, the, cr the cricket is a dirty slapper. The ants do what they like with the cricket. They take her roughly. They fuck her ragged, frequently one after another. In exchange, the cricket receives something to eat afterwards. Bits of dead flies. But sometimes she doesn't get anything. Then the ants say the cricket should be glad she's got a roof over her head. They say the cricket should be glad the ants don't send her away. Back. Back into the snow. In the Thai Chinese Vietnamese restaurant, the Golden Dragon. The old man tightened the spanner. Oh, tighten the spanner. It's not easy because the boy is thrashing his head backwards and forwards all the time. Backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. Watch it! Or I'll pull the wrong tooth out by mistake. A healthy one. But the thin one holds the boy, holds it tight. A bit more vodka. Be calm, boy. Nice and calm. No, no. Tighten the spanner. Number 82, Pat Thai guy, stir fried rice noodle. Hi, tighten the spanner. Oh, the boy screams, he can see the spanner. He falls in the boat. He snaps the tooth out of my mouth. He snaps it off me. He pulls it out of me. And the tooth flies through the air. I ripped the tooth out of his mouth, his right front tooth, and the bloody half rotten tooth flies through the air. Up into the air. The tooth flies and flies, and it keeps flying. The woman in the red dress is packed a few things, only essential clothing. Everything else is staying here. The communal purchases for the shared future. Her husband, or her former husband, was quite drunk by the end of their talk. And in the end, he ran off to buy some more to drink in the little shop downstairs. Beer, wine, vodka? The woman is in the kitchen. He hasn't come back. And she won't wait much longer. It can't be. Can't be that I married the wrong man. It can't be that everything's falling apart. And it's my fault. Before? I've, I've met another man. You've done what? I've, I've met another man. That, that can't be. It's, it's true. It happened. We just met by chance. Where? Who? Who? We were rehearsing with the choir. He, he just joined. One time afterwards, he brought everybody drinks. He was good looking, sense of humor. He was a good dancer. He was a very good dancer. You, you danced with him? Yes. Yes, I did. I've, I've fallen in love. And, and now I... 
I was never planning to leave my husband. Never. Only it kept getting stronger. Suddenly, being with him felt much more important than everything else my husband and I ever experienced. It all failed. You, you lied to me. And then a secret weekend in Venice, and I lied. I said I was with my best friend Eva. Eva lied to me. She covered me. She said it was great in Venice, and it was. It was beautiful. Really beautiful. The dude flies and flies, flies and it flies. It flies and it keeps flying through the tiny kitchen of the Golden Dragon. The extracted tooth keeps on flying. It keeps on flying and it lands in the walk. Number eighty-two, fat Thai guy. She's sixty-nine years old, born on the northern edge of the Chinese highlands, far, far away from here. Now she takes a large spoon and tries to fish the tooth out of the walk. Still waiting for the soup, number six. I want to get that tooth out of the wok full of stir-fried rice noodles, number eighty-two. I'm trying to fish it out of the pan with a large spoon. Number six, Thai soup with chicken. And the tooth shoots out of the wok. It flies and it keeps on flying till it lands in the soup bowl. Number six, Thai soup with chicken, coconut milk, Thai ginger, tomatoes, button mushrooms, lemongrass, and lemon leaves. Hot. The soup. It's on its way out. It's just being carried out. Table eleven. Two women by the window. Twenty-eight and thirty-one. Both in the dark blue uniforms of flight attendants. One of them has dark brown hair. The other one is blonde. Both of them come here a lot. They live here together in the building, and the dark one has a boy's friend who she brings along with her sometimes. The dark one had ordered number twenty-five, dummy bat, and the other one number six, Thai soup with chicken. They are both tired. They've both been on a long flight. They have come from Santiago de Chile. It's almost as far south as you can get. Chile is supposed to be wonderful, but they didn't have a chance to see the city. And then they talk about things like suitcases with wheels and uniforms and haircuts and people at work. The two of them share a flat, and they're both really tired. And the pretty waitress brings them their food, number twenty-five and number six. And then they both eat in silence. She's not a bad little girl, that one. Have you? You've got to give it a try. She'll do anything mm -hmm. for something to eat. She'll do anything, anything. I really do mean anything, anything, anything you want. It wasn't such a good idea, going for a meal after such a long flight. What have we got left to say to each other? It would have been better if they had gone straight to the flat, but this is what had been arranged, and somehow that stuck. And the air in the plane, the long flight, and the air in the plane is terrible. Whenever I fly across the Atlantic, I always think of sharks. But when you look down out of the window, you don't see much. Every seat on the flight has been taken. Chileans, Argentinians, Bolivians, with the faces of Indios. The meal is served. There's a choice of chicken fricasse or pasta. And once they've flown past Angola, Gabon, Sierra Leone, and they've gone as far as Gambia and Senegal, Inga, one of the stewardesses, says to Eva, the other one, "Look down there." What is there? Look there! I can't see anything. What is it? There! Look! I can't see anything. There's just water. No, there! Where? There! Isn't that a boat? A boat? How can you see that from up here? Yes, 
Yes, that's a boat. A boat full of people. From 33,000 feet up. An old man came to the cricket and told her, To me. Come on. To me, I come on to be young again. But it didn't work. The cricket did what she could. But he couldn't be young. No matter what the cricket did. <gasps> if I if I could have one wish said the old man. And then for a long time, he said nothing. And she did what she could. And he said nothing for a long time. And then he got very angry. The old man got very angry with himself, with old age. He got angry because he couldn't be young anymore. And in the end, he got angry with the cricket. I thought you knew what to do. And because the old man was so angry, he was unfair and he was struck by that. He couldn't be young anymore, but he was still strong and heavy. And he tore out one of the cricket's feelers. Now, Inga Iniba. The two stewardesses are eating number 25 and number 6 and the conversation picks up again briefly because they're talking about the sunset when flying west, they talk about nightfall above cloud level, the end of the day being distorted, teased out into something strange and long and they talk about the sunrise when flying east, they talk about daybreak above cloud level, red and unreal, a sunrise which the plane is flying towards, a dawn which is distorted, stunted, squeezed and how beautiful it is nevertheless. Then they're both silent again. This time for a long time. Both thinking. Sometimes their eye falls on the carpet on the wall which shows a golden dragon. The waitress walks past. She asks, Do you like any more drinks? Would you like any more drinks? Uh, no, thank you. Smile. All three smile. The dark stewardess Eva carries on eating her 25 and Inga, the blonde stewardess, eats number 6. Would you like to try this, Eva? Yeah, sure. She slurps the soup off the spoon. Eva slurps the soup off the spoon. Uh, the best Asian soup I ever had was in San Francisco. Oh, yes. Yes, in San Francisco. Really good. Wonderful. Really good. It is, isn't it? And then, in the bottom of the soup bowl, in among the lemongrass and the Thai ginger, Inga finds a tooth, a bloody tooth, lying in the bottom of the bowl, a tooth, an entire tooth, slightly bloody, slightly decayed, a human incisor. That's disgusting, says the other one. I'm not eating anymore. A human incisor. That's disgusting. I'm not eating anymore. We're leaving. I'm leaving. I'm not staying here a minute longer. Disgusting. That is disgusting. A tooth. A bloody tooth in the soup. Are you coming? You're not coming. Stands up, walks, storms out. The blonde woman, Inga, 31, sees sitting there with the tooth with a gruesome hole in it in the spoon in front of her. She keeps looking at the tooth. Other people find a golden ring in the stomach of a fish. Other people find a diamond in long grass. In the kitchen of the Asian Thai Vietnamese restaurant, the Golden Dragon, the hole where the boy's tooth will not stop bleeding. Let me have another look. It's been bleeding the whole time. Show me. Maybe we have to singe it. We have to singe it so it stops bleeding. Where's the tooth? The tooth. What if we put the tooth back in the hole? The tooth's gone. It's gone? Go on. Where's the tooth? Where's it got to go? It must be somewhere. Didn't it just drop on the floor? It must have just... The boy puts his head back and the old man tries to plug the hole in the upper jaw. Uh, the old man says, what is that? What is that? I don't believe it. 
Why? I cannot believe this. Why? There's someone there. What? There's someone inside. Where? In the hole. Next door to the Golden Dragon, a little shop that's opened late into the night. The shopkeeper, Han, has gone and got a takeaway from the Golden Dragon. Number 103. As always, hot. Extra hot. The man in the striped shirt opened a bottle of vodka while he was still in the shop. And now he's standing at the counter next to the little shop's cash register and he's drinking with the owner, Hans. Hans is saying, uh, then let, let her, let her then, uh, you, you know, uh, you know, uh, Hans, like the man in the striped shirt, has already had quite a few. You know the saying, don't you? No, I don't know it. The gist of it is, it's not worth upsetting yourself over women, or never let a woman get you down, or no woman is worth getting all miserable about. I don't know, I, I can't really remember. In the foil container under the counter, the smell still hangs in the room. The leftovers of number 103. Anyway, I've got something special for you. Maybe. Come with me. Hans locks the shop from the inside. He pulls open a drawer behind his heavy shop counter and takes out a key. Come with me. Let's see. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, you're my friend. Come with me. The Golden Dragon, number 41, Thai chicken, very hot. I don't believe this. Why? I cannot believe this. Why? There's someone there. What? There's someone inside, in the hole, where the young Chinese boy's tooth was. A group of people are sitting in a circle. Why do you never call? You should call us. We've been waiting so long for you to phone. In the hole where the tooth was, which is not so bleeding, sit my mother, my father, my uncle and my aunt. Why do you never call? You should call us. I'm worried, says the mother. I'd at least like to know whether you got there. And my father says, I'd at least like to know where you are, my son. Where are you, my son? I'm in the golden dragon, in the kitchen. And uncle has pulled out one of my teeth. A tooth? That's terrible. Tell us. Yes, it's terrible. Tell us, uh, are you earning well? I know, uncle. You will get it all back. And what about your sister? Have you found your sister yet? I've got to go. All the best. Goodbye. Goodbye, boy. And look after yourself. Have you found your sister yet? No, I haven't found her yet. I don't know where I'm supposed to be looking. Look, look after yourself, my boy. Look after yourself. How was the journey? I've got to go. It's really bleeding. Goodbye. Oh, the journey, yes. Well, another time, maybe. Goodbye. Goodbye, boy. And look after yourself. Look after yourself. Look after yourself. A young man approached the ant and said, You've got that cricket in your flat. What does she cost for an hour? A short time later, the young man was alone with the little cricket in a room. There wasn't much there. Just a bed, a table, a chair. You know, he said, My girlfriend's pregnant. And I didn't want the child. And since she's been pregnant, I can't touch her anymore. I find it repulsive and then I had to find a new job because otherwise there wouldn't be enough money for three. Now I have to feed everyone and I think I deserve something for myself. I think I deserve something really special and now I'm going to let myself have it. And then he treated the cricket not like a cricket, but like a thing that can be paid for and that doesn't matter if it gets broken. 
he probably treated the cricket the way he would have liked to have treated his pregnant wife. And when the ant saw what the young man had done to the cricket, he said, You can't come back. Or, You can come back. But for what you want, You've got to pay a lot more. Triple. Night. In the two stewardesses flat. Inga, the blonde stewardess, sits at the table alone in the dark. The only light comes from the street lamp outside. She is yet to take off the uniform, the dark blue skirt, the tights, the high heel shoes, the scarf. Lying in front of her, in the light of the street lamp, is the tooth. The tooth has a hole in it. It lies on the tooth in front of her. The hole runs through the entire tooth and inside her. It's possible to see light through the hole. Normally, whenever she gets home after such a long flight, she gets undressed straight away. How did the tooth get into the spoon? Who did the tooth belong to? How much pain did that person feel? She calls out to her flatmate, Eva. Eva! If Eva doesn't hear her, she's in the next room. Her boyfriend's there. The tooth lies on the table in front of the blonde woman. The woman puts the tooth in her mouth. The tooth stays a little bit like Thai soup and a little bit like blood. Her tongue feels for the hole in the strange shoe. And then she puts the tooth back on the table. What is she going to do with the tooth? She can't throw it away. The shopkeeper lives above his shop. You only have to go up one flight of stairs. The man in the striped shirt says, I've uh, never been inside your flat. The shopkeeper says, You've never been inside my flat? No. Really? No, never. Come in, come in. This is... What? This is incredible. Why? The man in the striped shirt opens another beer and walks incredulously around in the shopkeeper's flat. This is incredible. Why? What is? The shopkeeper's flat is not a flat, but rather a kind of warehouse, which is stacked to the roof with provisions, rice, noodles, milk, salt, sugar, all over the place. Everything's full of it. This, this isn't a flat. Why? It's a warehouse. A warehouse? What kind of warehouse? A warehouse for provisions. Everything here is full. Provisions are important. Provisions are more than important. In the summer, nobody thinks about them. But in the winter, when it gets cold. You're going to have to dig a tunnel to get through that lot. Inga, the stewardess, at the table at night with no light. The only light? The glow from the street lamp. In front of her, the tooth on the table. The tooth casts a shadow. What to do with it? I can't throw it away, but I can't keep it either. In the next room, Eva, the second stewardess, says to her boyfriend, You know what? Downstairs in the Golden Dragon tonight, Inga found a tooth in a soup. What kind of soup? In the Chinese downstairs, the Thai soup, number six, a human tooth. I never found a tooth in my soup. When Eva and her boyfriend met, he told her, You look like a Barbie doll. You look like a Barbie doll. And when they got together, she told him, Now you're the Barbie fucker. <laughs> yeah, I'm the Barbie fucker. So, how was the flight? How was the flight? The Barbie fucker asks now. 
the flight was okay everything was fine until inga found a tooth in her soup so shall we go to bed giba next door in bed with her boyfriend who she calls the bambi fucker in the dark living room on the table in front of the blonde room the tooth it's getting late the granddaughter rings on her grandfather's bell grandfather tell us something as i come to tell you yes what is it my child what is it what's the matter what's the matter i'm going to have a baby a baby Oh. I'm going to have a baby but I don't want to. I wish everything was like it was before. In the Thai Chinese Vietnamese restaurant the Golden Dragon the boy will not stop bleeding. If we could find a tooth. The tooth's gone. I'm really cold. He's he's really pale. So cold, but it it's always warm in here. Warm, yes, it's warm from the gas rings. It's warm in here. It's cold here. It, it's your circulation. Yeah, that's right, my circulation. Now seventy one. Ra ra so to no. And then the boy falls off his stool. He is here. The boy is white as snow. White like a lily. White like cherry blossom. He's dead. He's bled to death. Oh, 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 boy. Oh, boy. Number B five. Pulls out out fried beef with Chinese leaf and lemongrass. The Chinese boy has bled to death, and he's lying on the floor of the tiny kitchen of the Chinese Thai Vietnamese restaurant, the Golden Dragon. Eva and her boyfriend. Up all this causing the Bobby fucker. <laughs> He maybe thought it was funny. <laughs> I know it's a stupid word, Bobby fucker, and I don't know why I didn't stop calling him it. I'm too young for him. I wonder what he feels when he touches my young body. When I touch his body, I can feel the age. He's good looking. He's an attractive man, but I can feel the age of his skin. I like him a lot. Maybe I despise him at the same time, or I despise myself, and that's why I call him it. If I could be something completely different from what I am, if I could be another person, if I could have one wish, if I wasn't the Flight attendant and the Barbie fucker's lover anymore, and if the Barbie fucker wasn't the Barbie fucker anymore, if we could swap, then I'd be the still attractive pilot who's flown to every country on earth, and he, he would be that pretty flight attendant who is currently spending a life in a droning cylinder, thirty-three thousand feet above sea level, handing out meals. What would that be like? In the kitchen of the Golden Dragon, the Chinese boy, the new boy, who was looking for his sister, or had looked for her, lies dead on the floor, next to the gas bottles, bled to death, quick as a flash. What are we going to do with him? He can't. He can't stay here. He he can't stay lying down there. Oh my God! Oh my God!
They wrapped the dead Chinese boy in a carpet, which they took off the wall out front in the Golden Dragon in a moment when there was no one else in the restaurant. It's the carpet for the Golden Dragon, which the dead Chinese boy always wanted to have a closer look at, because there aren't any carpets like that where he comes from. But now, it's too late. Oh, my boy. My boy. The Golden Dragon closes. The light goes out in the restaurant and the red lanterns go out outside the door. The click of the light switch. One of the cooks locks the door from the outside. The others leave the restaurant by the back way. On their shoulders, they're carrying a heavy rolled up carpet. It's a warm night. The cricket had thought that the ant had fallen asleep. Despite all the noise because they had drunk so much. That's why she came out of the room at half past one in the morning. But the ant hadn't fallen asleep. He was awake. Or almost awake still. And he had a visitor. A man in a striped shirt. He was awake. They were both sitting there drinking and smoking. And the music was so loud it was almost unbearable. Suddenly, there's a young Asian girl standing in the room. I say, Hey, where did you come from? He says, Hey, where did you come from? Hey, where, where, where did you come from? Say, Hans, where did she come from, Hans? Hans, wake up. Look who's here. Hans, where did you get her from? Hans has fallen asleep. Hans, wake up. Look, look who's here. The man in the striped shirt tells the cricket how beautiful she is. Come here, he says. Sit down here. He's completely drunk and there's something injured. Rough, malevolent in his drunken look. A look the cricket already knows. You look, you look like... Oh, you don't need to be afraid, honestly. There's, there's no need to be afraid at all. Look. I'm sitting here with Hans, uh, my friend Hans, and uh, we've had a bit to drink. Well, there's no law against it. But honestly, sweetheart, I just spilled some beer. He accidentally spills some beer. Not so bad. I'll clean it up late. What? What did you say? Not so bad. I'll clean it up later. But there's no need to be afraid at all. Don't be afraid. Not of me. Not of me. You look... You look so beautiful with those thin arms and thin legs. You look... You look like... You know what you look like. You look like a grasshopper. You look like a Chinese grasshopper. <laughs> Amazing. What a vision in the middle of the night. You bring thousands of years of history with you. History, you understand? China, the Great Wall, the Forbidden City, the desert, the Yellow River, the Silk Road, and the printing press. That's all Chinese. One billion Chinese. You do come from China, isn't it? That's where you're from? Come here. Sit down. Oh, come on. Let's have a chat. Come here. Night in the city. Outdoors. On a bridge over a river. The four Asians from the Golden Dragon and the dead young man rolled up in the carpet. You really want to throw him in the water. Where else can we take him? I don't know. Somewhere. This isn't right. Are we supposed to just leave him lying somewhere? Are we supposed to just leave him lying somewhere in the street? I hope you're not going to throw me off the bridge. I'm wondering what it's like to fall off this bridge. No, don't leave him lying in the street. What's going to happen to him if you leave him lying in the street? I hope they're not going to throw me off the bridge. Let's just throw him off the bridge. Off the bridge? Yes, well, we can throw him off the bridge. 
They heave the carpet up onto the railing of the bridge. They have to turn it round again. And then they unroll it. There it is again, the golden dragon. I can almost reach out after it. The carpet flutters briefly in the wind. Farewell. I fall from the bridge into the water and my head plunges into the cold river. Water rushes inside me through the hole left by the tooth and I swim for home. The river picks me up and carries me along, mile after mile. It flushes me into the North Sea, a current carries me northwards, along underneath the ice. Maybe a fish is pulling me, or a whale. It's a long journey. Here comes the Kamata Peninsula. Not far now, soon I'll be home. Past Japan in the distance in the grey light of dawn, and shortly before evening, that very same day, finally, China. I'm home. What do I look like? How long was I traveling for? Weeks? Months? Years? It's a long journey. It's, it's a very long journey. What do I look like? No flesh left on my bones washed clean by the water. A few algae. Not a pretty sight. I'm happy to be back home. I'm hungry. Oh, hello, dear honored uncle. All the money, everything you all contributed, you'll never see it again. I'm sorry. No, you'll never see it again. Oh, dear mother. How white your dark hair has turned. And father? He died two years ago. How sad. My sister, uh, no, I didn't find my sister. I'm sorry, it wasn't easy. I, I don't know what happened to her. Who knows where she is and who she's with and what she has to do for her money. It might be a good sign that she hasn't been in touch. Maybe she's cleaning somewhere. Or she's dancing. Has she never called? Maybe she can't call. Maybe? I always have this feeling that she's close by, really close by. Maybe she is well. How am I? Uh, fine. All right. It was a long journey. I lost a tooth. It hurt right from the start. It started hurting right after we set off, and I thought it would be okay, but it didn't get any better. The tooth kept hurting more and more, and it kept hurting till they took it out. In in the golden dragon, in the kitchen in the back, with the red spaniel. In the shopkeeper, Hans is flat. Hans had fallen asleep on the sofa. Are you mad? Are you, are you mad? Look, look what you've done to her. Look at that. She, she's bleeding. Oh, oh my God. She's not an animal. The man in the striped shirt muted, not sober. He's not really interested. So, sorry, um, I'm sorry. What did you do to her? Yeah, I... It just happened. I'm sorry. How is she ever good? How is she supposed to? You? You've completely ruined her. Completely ruined her. Oh God! Listen, listen, boy. You're going to pay for this. You, you can't just you. You're, you're going to pay me for this. Okay, Dad. The poor thing. Inga in her flat. She takes the tooth off the table, puts it in her jacket pocket, and leaves the flat. Loud music throbs from the door of the first floor flat. That's the shopkeeper's flat. Not a soul on the street. City at night, the light in the windows, not much traffic. She's soon on the bridge over the river. The Chinese come towards her. But are they Vietnamese? 
the whole family, if they actually are a family from the Golden Dragon. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Sir, at this time. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, going for a bit of a walk. <laughs> you still up now? At this time, it's late. It's <laughs> yes, it's late, but uh, I'm not tired. Not tired? No, I'm not tired. Ain't that good now, say, look. I found the stews in my soup today, in the Thai soup, number six Thai soup in your restaurant, the Golden Dragon. She doesn't say this. Yes, well, uh, have a nice evening. Thank you. You too. Good night. Good night. The blonde woman on the bridge. The Chinese people have disappeared. She stops in the middle of the bridge and looks down into the black water. She takes the tooth out of her jacket pocket of her stewardess uniform. She puts it back in her mouth again. Now no longer taste of blood and no longer a thigh soup. The woman on the bridge spits the tooth out like a cherry stone. I spit the tooth into the river. The tooth in the air briefly. But then the darkness under the bridge swallows the tooth. The woman can neither see nor hear it fall into the water. No one apart from the blonde woman knows that from now on there is a tooth lying in the bed of the river. The tooth is gone. As if it had never been there. On behalf of the cast, crew, and festival, Over to you. So much, Nitya, and uh, thank you, and all your colleagues and friends for that wonderful performance. Welcome, Roland. It's always such a delight to be able to listen to your words, and uh, equally hard to snap out of the universe that you create. So I'm going to begin uh, this session by asking you a question about the Golden Dragon, the play that we just heard perform. Um, I believe. Rollins, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you said somewhere, or um, you know, you in your worldview, there are four kinds of theatre that exist. There's the amphitheatre of the Greeks and the Romans, the uh, the Globe of of Shakespeare, the classic sort of peat box stage, and the roadshow. And for you, Golden Dragon was somewhat of a roadshow fantasy play. 
Could you, uh, if, if I am not mistaken about this, could you help me understand what you meant by that and what it is like for you to think about even a near future where all the promises of a roadshow fantasy may not be translatable onto the stage and we might be seeing more and more performances in, in this kind of a version? No. It, it, uh, it, is, it is interesting that although this, this play has been performed for the very first time in, in Vienna, in the Akademie Theater, which is for us German-speaking people sort of the temple of art, uh, of theater, I always had something very, very simple something really sort of handmade. Uh, uh, I don't like so much the term of poor theater, but I, uh, it was theater never as poor, in my opinion. But I was thinking about something very energetic that can be performed without almost anything. You just need a couple of actors, and basically that's it. Maybe a prop or two, but so that's what I mean with roadshow. You could do it, you could take it everywhere and hopefully it works. So and and with many of my plays, this is this has been the approach in the last years. There are others that are more sort of yeah, we need this puppet dollhouse setting of a real theater, but, but many are, are, are the, come from a concept that's more than basic. Um, but, um, of course, and I always thought, here you can see how <laughs> one can be very mistaken, um, that this sort of form of theatre is sort of undestroyable. And it will, will always work. We just, we don't need anything. We don't need even money from the state. We can do whatever we like. And now we learn that that is not the case because of the, the pandemic. The simple thought of coming together and perform on the street is not possible as it as it was, and that is that is tough because that is sort of the the most basic thing we can experience in art. Um, so this is something why 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 this this reading. You, you just did in such a beautiful way. It's, uh, it's really moving me in a, in, a, in a very emotional way. Because I'm not the biggest fan of online theater. Because we know how beautiful it is to have it in life, in the theater or wherever, on the street. You know, you have this guy sitting next to you who's coughing all the time and the other person who is making noises with not the popcorn, but something like that, you know, this, this life feeling, and now we don't have that. Um, but what, what, what you really achieve, what you really manage to do is uh, to save the essence of the idea, coming together, even if it's not possible in, in, in one space, and doing something together and, and, and sort of breathing together and getting together into the sex that is really, really strong. And and also took me to hear or to listen to that text in a different way. I mean, of course, I know the text. I've heard it. I've staged it myself, so I, I know it by heart. But what happened now is that I heard it for the first time again. And, I thought, oh, my God, this is so... This is so big. You come together so far away from me. You in India, I'm sitting in Berlin, and, and, and your time it's night, and here it is getting dark slowly in the afternoon, and 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 we're sharing this together. Uh, so this is this is a sort of trashy electronic roadshow again, in a way. <laughs> and I have to really thank you very very much. Uh, Roland, I'm going to come back to uh, talking about Golden Dragon maybe a little ahead and later in our conversation, but I want to go back a little bit to the beginning and uh, to your journey as a playwright. What is it that attracted you to playwriting? I mean, it's possibly one of the toughest, if not the toughest 
formats of writing. What is it? Would it be correct? Would I be correct to assume that it is dialogue, writing dialogue, creating dialogue that uh, attracted you or attracts you to playwriting? What made you start? I think, um, well, so strangely, I always had it in my mind that that would be my form of, of writing. I don't know exactly why, but that's when I, when I really started to write, I always started with plays. I think I did it uh, because, and that's getting back to the workshop, it is so simple. Many friends of mine, they wanted to go into the movie industry. Or, or TV, or, or you know, cinema, whatever. And I, I never liked the idea because I thought it was so complicated. Now, of course, with electronic cameras, it's more easy than it was maybe 30 years ago, where you needed the material and the celluloid and all this thing. But still, it's complicated. You need a lot of people. You need, you need the light, the settings. And theater is so simple. So that's what I liked about it, that it has a direct approach in the technical way. But looking at from from the from the sort of from the content or from the more artistic point of view, it is something very direct as well, because it get, it is the word, the spoken word, gets directly into the head or into the imagination of the of the spectator. So it is with speed of light creating or speed of sound, let's say, creating an image. But it doesn't cost you a thing, and it's there. So that's that's what I like about it. It is it is so energetic. And then, yes, dialogue important. I I refer. Yes, of course, but I think it has to do a lot of work to, to do with 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 rhythm. And 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 that's sounding now maybe a little bit. Uh, New Age style, but it is about the energy. It is, uh, and I'm not so much New Age, but but it is, it is about uh, energy and power, and concentration, and focus, and and then, and I think that's the most beautiful thing. And something we could observe even now here on the internet. It is about playing. Adults transform in front of the eyes of others into a character or, or, or whatever, or a narrator. And, and we, as human beings, we, we start to play, perform, or perform in a, in a playful way for others, and they enjoy it. So that is, that is so very archaic and so, so simple and so beautiful that I think that is, there's hardly anything that can that can compete with that in literature, because it's not, it's not like carved in the stone or, or, or wood. It is a, a fluent sort of a, a, the whole time moving process. It is a spoken word. It is it is, it is not something to to read. I would say, I don't know what the actors would say about this, but if you read The Golden Dragon for the first time, you go crazy. You don't understand a thing. You have to hear it. So, um, taking all this together, it is something, it is a vibrant form of art. I think that's why I'm so much attracted to it. I think you've described the, you know, playwriting so beautifully that one might be tempted to think that it is, um, you know, it's not as difficult as as um, as it really is, at least for for most most of us. I want to. Uh, I know it's not easy for for anyone to talk about their writing process, but I want you to still try and share something about it. What is it about the creative process of writing that you perhaps find the most difficult? And along the way, have you found um, ways in which you deal? With, with these sort of um, constant impediments that you might, uh, uh, you know, that you might encounter. And also, there's another part to this question that, you know, I believe that you weren't um, very fond of the first couple of plays that you wrote, um, if I'm not mistaken. What, what was that journey like for you? I mean, what, 
what is it that you didn't like about maybe your early writing and what might have been a point at which you said that I could do this and, and, and you started coming into your own as a playwright. I know this is, there are many parts to this question, mm -hmm. but uh, there are many parts to the writing process, so take it as you will. Uh, I think the most important thing about the writing process is that, that you can't really plan it. That is something one has to accept. It's the same thing like when you are talking to somebody, like we are talking right now, I know, of course, we, we have a sort of a plan what we want to say, but what exactly decides in, in the back of your head that the phrase that I'm saying now is coming out the way it does come out, because this is not prepared. So that is the same, in a way, with writing. You have the idea, you have it all planned, maybe you have even a big scenario put on the wall and you know where we're go and then you start and then it's just diving into the river and you don't know where it will take you. So I think that is the most important thing to accept. It is not, there is no perfect uh, plan. Maybe there is no plan and the end one has to accept that. So that is one thing. And the other thing is uh, sometimes the most important thing is time. We need time uh, to let ideas grow. And sometimes the long term. I mean, okay, I have the idea for such for this and this play, and then I, I, I bump or crash into a wall, and I can see that I can't go any further. I can take it where I want it, where I want to take it. And that is the point where you cannot force it. You just have to wait. And sometimes you have to wait a long time, maybe a couple of months, maybe a year, maybe even more. And uh, so uh, that is interesting because you, you, it's like you, you have the idea or maybe you have even the first scene and then you have to put it in the closet and you have to wait for how it will develop in, in the meantime. I, I, I mean, I, had, I have now a technique that I, since, well, I don't ins insist anymore. I let it, I let the thing to cover it. I let it wait, growing, sort of ripe, ripening in a way. And I concentrate on something entirely different. I go for a different thing. Uh, something that's more easy. Something where I already had, have found the clue. Uh, best to work on something entirely different, different style, different rhythm, whatever, to, to, to get away from this project that's growing secretly somewhere in, in, in the background. So that is, um, that is difficult because it needs a lot of patience, but it pays off because once the, as we say in German, once the coin drops <laughs> and you have the idea, then you can write the thing really fast. So I, I, I don't know how many weeks I, it, it took me to write The Golden Dragon. Not so many, but so many months before where I could not write a single word. So that's an interesting contradiction in a way. And uh, referring to the second part of your questions about the early work or the later work, I mean, that is something that is in a way, also a privilege that I, 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 can, I, I can look at my early work, things I wrote maybe when I was 25, 26, and, and, and I, I see that person, I see that angry young man looking or exploring and, and crossing borders and, and making mistakes, and, uh, and I would say, okay, that's not me anymore. I, I, I like it, or sometimes I could also say, I, I don't get it, <laughs> but it's, but of course it's always a, a, a part of me, so uh, I, I, I could not really judge it. I have to, I have, to, and uh, it's, it, it's going to be interesting, that's maybe even in a couple of years later, just to see how well, would I look on the Golden Dragon from that point of view. But, um, 
in in a way, this this is a, in, 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 it's just just uh, these words that are there outside that have to defend themselves alone out in the world of theater. Uh, they also assure me they are not a part of me anymore. They are independent, and that's very good. Yeah, like Didion said, that I've already lost touch with some of the people I used to be. But you know, uh, one of the one of the most integral parts of writing is editing. But mm -hmm. editing is, you know, is is again for different writers. It it bears different kinds of importance. There are writers who write. You know, their first draft is just something that comes out and it's pretty much entirely changed as it goes along the process of editing. And for some people, it's the first draft that really matters and, you know, editing is a is a smaller process of, of marginal tweaking. So I'm curious about what your relationship is with editing. And I'm also curious about how you edit. I mean, have you ever, for example, heard or asked uh, 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 somebody else, perhaps an actor, to read your play out or your first draft to you before you start editing? Because there's so many people who have said this to me and I've heard this said so many times that the experience of reading your play and listening to your play are very, very distinct experiences. So I'm curious about your process of editing. It's, editing is, is uh, of course, like, like in a movie, the editor has a tremendously important job. Sometimes people forget about that. They think that ah, the cameraman is so important or the director, but the editor as well. So editing is is uh, is elementary, and it is something I do on the way. I don't do it afterwards. There's not a first draft, and then I, I put it in the mixer and I do it in a, a new edit. Because I, I, I need the cuts and the editing to get to gain speed, usually. The editing of parallel storytelling is, is dealing with the very basics of narration, cliffhangers, speeding up, uh, pushing, pushing the play, slowing it down, and, and also, of course, letting little look in the trick box, uh, playing with the spectator. Expectations and and curiosity. And so it is, it sounds a little technical, but it is a, it is a powerful and, and, and very important tool. And, and, and I love it. I, I, I love editing, I love cutting. And, and, and it drives me mad as well. With Golden Dragon, I was at, at sometimes thinking, "Oh my God, this is getting a little bit too complicated." And and afterwards, I, I wrote some other plays that even play ball with different timelines. And then I was thinking, "Ooh, I'm getting lost. There's too many voices at the same time. And how do I get organ do I get this organized?" But then, after some time, this it works. It, I know. Then later. People in theaters go crazy for it because they also have to adjust to the form of editing and, and getting, uh, trying to get some orientation. But uh, it's it's uh, it's more than important. And I know I don't I never have actors reading plays to me. Uh, and usually I I also I don't think in actor so and so actor so and so that she or he could be the optimal actor for the part. Because that is something that spoils you a little bit. And when you have that voice in your head of that person and then, and then the text gets a little bit, I don't know, I don't like it. I, 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 if, if possible, I like to have it, to have it sound sort of open. Uh, also, it's the same that I don't have a, a, a concrete image of the play. If it's not a workshop play, then I'll, of course, something very, 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 very basic. Uh, so, but I, I, I try to avoid to get too, too, fa too, too fast into the real world, which would be <laughs> the contact with the actress or the actor. You know, I want to um, move on to what you write about, themes, if you will, that emerge from your plays, or um, perhaps that 
seems very much uh, for me as, as, as somebody who's read your plays. Um, there is the element, the aspect of sort of cutting through society, of trying to write about more than one class in one play, particularly post-Arabian night. There is a socio-political consciousness that we see, for example, in Golden Dragon that we just heard, uh, or Winter Solstice for that matter. And then there is a, a sort of very keen observation of um, the eternal human condition, if you will, a sort of compressed reality that's also then augmented by, um, you know, street surrealism of absurdity or playfulness, if you will, whatever your chosen uh, term for it might be. I'm curious to know where the preoccupations that you address through your writing, through your plays, come from. Um, it's, it's interesting that you use the term post, post Arabian night because it's true. Uh, something has changed, uh, uh, and I, 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 I do more political or more aware, maybe political is not the best term, but more aware of, of society and, uh, and and try to make the plays in a way more important, speaking to so many people and telling relevant stories. So, uh, of course, that's a, that's relevance is a very wide term, maybe too big, but um, it is something that it comes to me more and more that I, that, that let's say, maybe to, to use a very, another very, very big term, in, injustice, something that keeps uh, driving me. And, and uh, in, in, I mean, talking about Golden Dragon, of course, especially with the, uh, uh, let's, let's say, the, no, that's not, 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 a word, not a good word to say, but uh, it's a, the, the war of sexes, I wanted to say, but it's not, but it is, I mean, it is a very hard play about the abuse of women, and also it is, of course, a, a, a to try to to focus on something that is a central element of our times, that is migration, and and the uh, the, the, the the huge gap between the first, second, and third world. So uh, and, and 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 that is, I think, our big theme. I mean, right now one would say, okay, Corona's everything, but I think that's temporary, hopefully that's temporary. Then we will get to, we will, we will get back to that, and so that is unjust again. How do we live in a world which has so many parallel worlds in it? Um, so, uh, that's, that's something I can't get rid of anymore, and I'm, 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 I'm finding it more and more difficult just write a nice comedy. Actually, I never did. I, 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 sometimes I would like to do it, actually, but, 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 but then somehow the political impact s slips in and puts his foot in the door and there it is. Well, it doesn't have to be one or the other, but, you know, one of the conundrums of uh, this sort of thinking about injustice, writing about injustice, um, is that you know you are you know you're talking about the experience experiences of immigrants the experiences of those who are on the receiving end of oppression many times you're talking about the experiences of women um, and you're talking about the experiences of uh, less privileged classes as well um, can that get tricky I mean this sort of burden of representation or you know recreating the experiences of character that perhaps you have not you know, that, that is not close to your experience. It, it is, absolutely. That's complicated. That's uh, because uh, if imagining that, it, let's say, a German white average actor would perform the part of somebody from a totally different culture or ethnic background, 
that's edgy. I, I would still defend the idea that it's possible and that the, the, the attempt to do so is not meant as an insult to, the, to whatever character is, be, is represented or written by me. But uh, because in my, in, in my understanding of theater, it is opening worlds in, in maybe a playful and maybe sometimes even provocative way, but it's, it's, it's always uh, in a gesture of, of including and not excluding. So, but uh, it is tricky. So one has to find a, a conscious way to deal with that. that. I have to accept there are things I could not write about in an acceptable modern way. I would, and I would say, okay, I'm, I'm definitely not the, identical to the character I'm just inventing. I might be the total opposite. I will, try, I will still try to do so. But maybe it would be best to do, have a little question mark on the side of this. And, 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 that, and we, including this question mark, passing it over to the actors or actresses. That is what happened basically in The Golden Dragon. So changing the male actors would do the female parts and the other way around and the young actors doing the old parts and so on. And no, at that time in Germany there was no or very little amount of Asian based actors. Now it is changing. But when the play was written, it was it was the theater work was very white, very 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 European, mm -hmm. Caucasian, whatever you call it, uh, that concept. And uh, and so I was I was afraid that this is going to be ridiculous. It would be horrible if you have a German theater group and they pretend to be uh, Chinese or Asian waiters. That would smell like having making fun of. Them. Uh, or, and, and, and so that I needed this, this way of, of, of changing it and, and showing to the audience this is we are we are not what we are playing. We are pretending we are, we are getting we're trying to get closer. Maybe at some point we are even uh, questioning cliches and and using them by questioning and and we're, we're, we're trying to get somewhere which is beyond our usual horizon of uh, competency. That's that's sort of the idea. And of course, in that, if you do that, the the, the, the surrealism is important because it takes you it takes you to another level and it gets rid of this. This, this competition with reality. It is it is clear that the surrealism or the fantastic elements. This is about art and imagination, and not on a one-to-one -one scale uh, reproduction of the real world. It's an echo of the real world, but it's not a photo. So um, that's 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 important to to mark that with all. The good intentions and all the political background is still an artistic process. You know, um, your you your plays are performed all over the world. They've been, you know, you perhaps the most um, performed playwright from Germany, and perhaps one of the most performed playwrights in the whole world. I um, I can't help but wonder what your relationship is like with translation. I mean, you, of course, speak um, English as well, and you, know, you speak German, but would you prefer to do your translations yourself? Have you ever come across a translation that you've been less than comfortable with? I mean, language is essentially a tool, and writers spend so much time perfecting that one word. What happens? Um, and what are the dangers of what can be lost in translation? Uh, of course, there's always something lost in the translation, but there's something to be gained as well. That is, and that is, I think that that is the big uh, work for the translators, and that's why they are 
so underestimated. Now in Germany, now that's changing. Now they put the name of the translator also on the front of the book, not on the great name of the other. It's not something very nice, I would say. And very important. I have I have a very good relationship with some translators, especially with David Tushingen from, from, from the UK, and uh, with Ulf Peter Halbert from Sweden. And, uh, and, and, and those two would get back to me and have a question and maybe about understanding a little bit, uh, some details, and, and then the, sometimes we come to the point when, when I, where, where I have to say, hey, this is something I cannot judge on an English or on Swedish. I, I cannot judge this, but you have to do to make that decision. And, and, and since they are so good with understanding of what I want, and they have their own instinct for their own language, I always go for in the end, the translator has to take that decision. If, of course, everything is technically under control. And then uh, it, is, it is something very interesting because with the text, uh, with the languages, the rhythm changes. If a German text sounds in <laughs> translated into, let's say, French, entirely different. And, and that's weird because the German rhythm is harder and has this almost cliche-like hard sound and, and the French much softer, like English is more soft, flowing, beautiful. Um, and you say, oh, that's weird. That doesn't sound so bad. And sometimes I, I, because I could never translate myself into another language, but in, in some cases I'm playing with it uh, when I've been working with my, my, my theater group in, in Cuba, in Havana, um, I knew I could not write the play in Spanish, but I had sort of the sound pretty much in my mind. So I had a, a good friend of mine, also an actor in the show, who was helping me with putting it into the right Spanish words. And then I retranslated it into German later. That was my closest experience was sort of a, a crossover thing. And now I, I did a version of uh, Carmen, of, and, and oh, it should be performed by an immigrant woman who speaks in an English which is definitely not perfect. So I could do that because I know my English is not perfect, so it won't, it, it, it will be okay. So. Moving on from uh, your relationship with translators to your relationship with directors. I mean, the thing about playwriting, of course, is that you, unlike maybe a novel or uh, journalism, which you also did initially, um, you cannot present your work directly to an audience. I mean, there are intermediaries. There's, there's the actor, there's the actors, and then, of course, there's the director. Um, your plays have been performed, like I said earlier, all across the world. I am curious to know what... Um, have been some of the aspects, the more frustrating aspects of relationships with directors that uh, that you've been through, and some of the more perhaps um, you know sort of um, liberating and wonderful experiences that you might have had with directors, and and what kind of cultural differences have you found when it comes to direction, maybe in the U.S. versus in Europe or London. Um, mm. Relating to directors, I know that that's just a big topic, but I'd, I'd like you to go for it. It's, I mean, it, it, that's, of course, always a, 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 a very tense relationship <laughs> between writer and, and director. Sometimes it is very beautiful. And it, it's beautiful where, or it works very well. It doesn't have to be beautiful, actually. It can be also rough. But uh, no problem with that. But uh, it is it is it, it works well. Uh, it's the best when the director takes the text and takes it to another level. But using the energy and the impulse that comes from the text it is so. If my, let's say my text is aggressive, the director would find a more aggressive way to find it. So, so we're leading it to the point where I, as a writer, would say. Oh, wow, this is some crazy shit that these people on stage are just doing. And, and, and that's what I always like. I like, I, I like uh, in a way, when theater goes to the extreme. And that, because theater is about, 
parking screen. That's that's important. And so that means if theatre sometimes avoids a little bit to hurt, then I would say no well. And then you get to the cultural differences. Maybe aggression in Germany is something different than aggression would be in let's say just picking an example in the UK and again in the US. Um, or maybe in the US there's more economic pressure on the production because there's no subsidized theater, so they would avoid nudity uh, of these things. Uh, so so they, that's where I sometimes would say, yeah, this is maybe, this could be more edgy sometimes. But, uh, but I could not generalize it in, at all. I've seen fantastic work, uh, performances in my work in, in, in London, in the very beautiful Golden Dragon in, the, in New York as well. So, but sometimes I would say, ah, well, you see that in that, in that culture people would not uh, fight. But again, coming from Cuba, with the Latino temperament, they would shout at each other all the time. That's the way they communicate. It's beautiful. I have a follow-up question from uh, Ramu Ramanathan, who is one of our best known playwrights and directors, and has directed Arabian Night, a production that I had a small uh, part to play in, as well as a, a, a designer, production designer. Um, he was curious to know, is there any director that you would like to collaborate with who you haven't yet collaborated with? Uh, I, I, I could not drop a name just like this. I, I, I would, it, it would be very unfair for all the others. <laughs> uh, that, and and I, I'm not saying it out of politeness. Uh, uh, I, 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 would, I would think about two or three right now, and I, but I won't say it. Okay, well, you could tell them in private. But final question from me to you. You spoke earlier about the idea of relevance, and, and you rightly mentioned that it's a very um, a big word. It's a very subjective word, and so is success. I'm curious to know, as my final question, how do you see relevance and success how do you measure it when it comes to playwriting and playwrights? And in that context, who are some of the playwrights that you really look up to or keep taking cues from? Um, the, I think, in the, in, in, maybe I'm a little bit old school in that in the, in, the, in, in, in that sense, but I always get back honestly to Shakespeare. And to the to the view to, to the big Greek writers like Oripides and and, and so forth. That's, and when it happens to me that I don't get when I'm stuck, or when I'm really I'm badly stuck and in a very bad mood, <laughs> then I, I try to read a little bit of Shakespeare to get out of that. Because I'm say, oh, this guy always had to sort of putting the finger on the wound. And he's, he's never cheap, and he's always always getting to the to the center. Of it. So that's um, the, uh, upon many, of course, more modern and and uh, uh, contemporary writers that I adore. This is sort of my, my basic reference. And um, well, success, I don't know. I I think if a play is, has some relevance in it. It doesn't have to be for all time. It doesn't have to last two thousand years like a Greek play. But if it has something to tell about us now, or about the human condition, uh, then it will find its way to the audience. If it is uh, too complicated, too whatever, let's say, brainy and too theoretically and too maybe too much in love with its own sound, then there's always the danger that the audience just gets bored and doesn't connect. And if the audience doesn't connect, no success. Thank you for that. Uh, I have a million more questions, but my time is with you is up. Um, but thank you for talking to me, and uh, thank you for everything that you do, and I hope you keep writing, and I will keep reading your plays, and hopefully see them 
the way they are supposed to be performed. Thank you once again, Roland, and over to you, Nitya. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, and thank you so much, Mr. Roland and Ms. Pragya, for perfectly rounding off the evening. While we have to sign off for today, we have a packed day tomorrow as well. At the festival, there are more panel discussions, talks, workshops, and more performances as well. You can head on to tatalitlife.in to find our entire schedule and more details. Before we end, I'd like to thank our sponsors, our title sponsor, Tata, and our session sponsor, Goethe Institute. Thank you for joining us once again. This is Tata Literature Life 2020.